The Denver Broncos roll over the Los Angeles Rams in their preseason finale, and now the table is set for this week as roster cuts begin as they trim from 90 to 53. Who stood out in the Broncos' third and final preseason game? Plus, did one player make it significant enough of a case to make the active roster? Well, you're going to get all that and much more with a cup of coffee on this morning's GMB. Good morning, Broncos country. What's up? Welcome into another episode of GMB, where we break down all things Denver Broncos here on Mile High Sports. I'm Cody Rourke, your host as always, Broncos reporter for Mile High Sports. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube page. If you love Colorado sports, every team, every day, you get Broncos coverage from me. You get Nuggets coverage from Ryan Blackburn. You get Avalanche coverage from Arif Dean, and you get Drew Creaseman on the Colorado Rockies as we break down a whole bunch of other things here. And look, we got some exciting things in store here at Mile High Sports. We're glad you could be part of this. But, hey, let's talk about what everybody wants to know. Hey, what's going on with the Denver Broncos following their preseason win on Saturday? Well, first off, I think before we get to what's happening next, we have to talk about what happened, what was. And that was at the Broncos. They rolled over the Los Angeles Rams 41 to nothing in Saturday's preseason finale at Empower Field at Mile High. It was the opening for fans to be able to see new upgrades at the stadium, at the club level. If you had suites, you saw the evident upgrades, some new food services, food pricing for certain things. But more importantly, you got to see a brand spanking new Jumbotron that is the tallest in the NFL. And I took a picture of it on Twitter. Doesn't necessarily do it any justice. In person, it is massive. And for the Broncos, obviously, they came out in this game against the Los Angeles Rams, which to the point I want to go back to when everyone was looking at practice, when we were watching joint practices, you saw different reactions on social media. Okay, the Broncos are getting, you know, rolled over by the Rams. Practice doesn't matter in that sense because the Broncos came out and the backups, they, they did a tremendous job led by Jared Stidham. Look, he got the start. Jaleel McLaughlin got the start with him, which I think is a very promising sign for maybe the optics of his roster standing here as roster cuts are going to be made official on Tuesday by 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. That's 2 p.m. Mountain time. Denver has to be from 90 to 53. And then the process will formulate for the practice squad, adding players to it. You get 16 spots, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that it's just – it's tough to quantify maybe where the Denver Broncos will go. We'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But I'd say for the most part, you know, for the Broncos to come out and their backups, more importantly, because, look, hey, the backups have struggled in the other preseason games. For them to come out and do what they were able to do, Jarrett Stidham was especially sharp in Saturday's preseason action. He finished 17 of 28 for 238 yards and one touchdown. But, man, this is a guy who I saw just patient in the pocket, let let plays develop a little bit, saw the field, I think, relatively well because he'd go from his first read to his second read, and then, bam, okay, if those guys are covered, hey, my third read's open, bam, lead him in stride. We saw him connect with little Jordan Humphrey on a couple of third down plays. We saw him go to Albert Okuwebunam, who we're going to highlight here on today's episode of the show, but he also had two really big plays downfield. I think the first one, obviously, to Marvin Mims, he unloaded it down the right side for 50 yards. Marvin Mims made a terrific catch. There was two defenders in his area. One guy pulled him. They, they called the legal contact or pass interference on him. He still hauled it in. We thought that initially, I mean, he sold it really well. He went to the ground, didn't seem like he was touched, got up and ran, and they called it a touchdown. It was reversed. But on that play, Jared Stidham took a shot. I mean, we talk about, you ever watch WWE, you look at like a Goldberg Spear he got speared in half on that play there. He stood down for a little bit, had to come out for a play. He was all good, though. He came back in. And then a little bit later in the second quarter, he delivered a 49-yard bomb, just an absolute dime, threaded it perfectly to Brandon Johnson downfield. So you got to see Marvin Mims. you got to see Brandon Johnson, two guys who have expectations on them after Jerry Judy's hamstring injury. Questionable for week one, as we know. So these two guys are getting acclimated. They're getting some run here on the offense. And the one thing I noticed about Marvin Mims that stands out to me in a big way is his, his speed, his ability to get behind defenses. And so I couldn't help but picture, man, if Russell Wilson just throws that deep ball, the, the moon ball as we call it here, to Marvin Mims, how many big plays are we going to see from him this upcoming season? He does have speed. It is dynamic. You can use him on things like end arounds, which we saw in the preseason game. He got face massa really a dangerous play and and look uh, this was the first time like I'll say like I was surprised you know we saw an NFL ejection 
from that. And, and I understand like you cannot grab the face mask and yeah, you got to let off going back and watching the replay. But I don't know if there was any ill intent by the Rams defender on that, but you know, a learning lesson for him and, and luckily Marvin Mims is okay. But I, overall, I just think the overall operation for Denver was, was efficient. It was clean. And that's something that Sean Payton liked. You saw it from the starting offense that was out there, the twos. Uh, you had the offensive line, had Alex Pocheski on it. You had Will Sherman. You had some other guys getting mixed. Quinn Bailey at left guard. I thought he did a terrific job. So Denver's going to have to have some tough choices, you know, when they go and dwindle their roster here. But I had a chance to ask Broncos head coach Sean Payton after the game because he's talked so much about how do you build the perfect 53-man roster? How do you build the right roster? But also at the same point, like your practice squad is super important. Here's what Broncos head coach Sean Payton had to say following the Broncos win on Saturday. I think what's important when you're talking about practice squad players, are they developmental? Are they guys that you feel like have an upside curve to it? Um, coaches, all of us in general, can be very protective and say, well, I, this way I'll be a perfect practice squad player. Well, he's not if, if you don't see an upside to become – a 53 player and and with the rules the way they are now there's so much more flexibility so i i, I know it's 53 and 16 but I, I look at it much differently i look at it as you know that that's the entire roster um you know we'll put up there once we get this roster cleaned up we'll put the current undrafted players that our league's seen in the last 20 years and guys that have been on the practice squad in the last 20 years it's amazing to see um, many of them are on big contracts now. Um, so I, I think there's got to be a, a clean and correct vision for a practice squad player. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, you're, you're gathering all the information. And, and But every team this year will have players coming off that 16 up and playing, I mean, significant roles. And obviously for Denver picking fifth in the waiver, wire order there they're going to have a good priority to get a lot of their guys back or to put claims in on other teams but I think the one thing we are going to see is there are going to be some players and I'm curious to see who Denver decides to move on from in a sense maybe in hoping that they can sneak them back onto the practice squad that goes to another team right we saw it last year I think it was uh, Seth Williams a wide receiver that the Broncos had drafted a few years ago he had a chance to come back to Denver he had a pretty good preseason had a pretty good training camp last year ended up going to the Jacksonville Jaguars, you know, and some guys are looking for opportunities elsewhere, but this is an audition for them. And while there some guys dreams with the Denver Broncos may end here in the next 24 hours, their dreams could still be getting for another team. Right. And look, and, and Sean Payton has been very big on saying these things here that he doesn't necessarily want the situation where they have a guy on their roster that can produce, that can help them, can be a player for them. And then they go to another team and they, and they go through and, and obviously have success that are away from them when they could have had success on the team in Denver. So Sean Payton, he says a lot of these things, right? And I think for all of us, we're trying to figure out and wait and see how much weight does that hold for him, right? You know, you look at other guys in terms of their performance, like Jaleel McLaughlin. Let's throw his name out there. Four touchdowns of three preseason games. Once again, he looked apart 4.8 yards per carry in the game against the uh, LA Rams on Saturday. You can't sneak a guy like that through waivers. Some team is going to claim him. Could be the Rams. Could be the 49ers. Could be the Cardinals. Could be everybody else that's been watching the Broncos because teams and, and scouting departments from around the league, you know, I don't know if many people understand this. They are assigned to watching games. Like if you go to a well, – you won't understand this, but like for me, example, like they have scouts from other teams that come to the games that sit up in the in the press box and they watch – players from both teams that are competing there. I mean, it's an opportunity, and it's not just one or two teams. It's three or four teams that have different scouts all around the NFL in attendance to always watch. And so I think that's always something you always have to keep an eye on is who stands out, who sees these guys, maybe in the way that we do, or maybe that you, the fan, see, you know, an impressive player. These things all matter here. Uh, Albert Okwebunam, a guy who, in my opinion, I think more than solidified that you absolutely cannot sneak him through the waiver wire like if you were to release him he's going to get claimed by some team and a very impressive performance by alberto and, and what we're talking about here he had seven catches 109 yards and hey, you love to see that from him i mean this is a guy who demonstrated so much confidence in saturday's game i'm very happy for albert i know how much work he's been putting in behind the scenes 
I have had a chance to get to know Albert a little bit last year, especially when all the dark stuff was going on. And this is a guy who's just been too talented to leave off the field, and yet Nathaniel Hackett and his staff, they left him off. And it was very baffling to me. But Albert O looks like an entirely different player right now here for the Broncos. And I think that's a good sign going forward. You have to make an argument here like, okay, with Jerry Judy's injury status, questionable for week one here. Okay, you have Cortland Sutton. You have Marvin Mims. Are you going to have Brandon Johnson in that mix as well as that third guy, little Jordan Humphrey maybe? Because Denver's obviously wide receiver depth is tested a little bit. You need guys that can step up and produce. You look at tight end. Yes, you have Adam Troutman, and you also have Greg Dulcich. No, no discounting against that. Chris Manhurts, a great blocking option, kind of like an extra lineman for you. But Albert O is the next big receiving threat that Denver has. When we talk about size, speed, athleticism, the ability, and, and obviously a new commitment to being invested as a blocker, dude had seven catches, 109 yards, and he also had a one-handed catch there, also had a touchdown haul in there. But this is a guy with six foot five height, 4.5 yard, 40 yard dash speed, and is a guy that you can use all over the field. He in my opinion, too talented to let go. And, and look, I know that there's been some rumors. Hey, Denver could look to trade him as the time that we're sitting down doing this show here this morning. That has not yet been the case here for Denver. So I'm very curious to see where things go here with Albert Okuwebunam. But Broncos country, we're going to continue the conversation on the show. We're going to give you some Broncos bits, some news and notes from Saturday's game, how it sets the table, what we saw from the offensive efficiency. You're going to get all that on this morning's GMB. Real quick, let me tell you about our friends over there at Superbook Sports. And you hear that. That's the sound of football coming back. And now is the time to place your preseason bets with Superbook Sports. Superbook is the most trusted name in Vegas, and now you can use promo code MILEHIGH to score up to $250 with their first bet bonus, win or lose. They will match your first bet up to $250 with promo code MILEHIGH. Don't miss out this football season. Win some money with Superbook Sports and the promo code MILEHIGH. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's get to some Broncos bits from Saturday's game. I, I love going through some of these statistical outputs here. Obviously, we know Denver rolled over the Rams 41 to nothing. A very efficient showing all across the board here coming from, obviously, Jarrett Stidham. Ben DiNucci had a little bit of magic late after a little bit of a slow start. But you saw guys step up. We already talked about Albert O. The seven catch, 109 performance, one touchdown. Jaleel McLaughlin had 10 carries for 48 yards here. You saw contributions from, from a multitude of players. And I, I think for Denver, the, the idea and the philosophy is you see it here offensively. Can we chunk apart opposing defenses, right? Can we run the ball effectively? Well? And then when we need to pass, can we dice them up in, in areas where, hey, maybe they're protecting against the run here? Take a look at some of these stats here for the Broncos in Saturday's game. Denver, they had 80 total offensive plays, folks. 80 total offensive plays. And they had 33 first downs. 33 first downs on 80 offensive plays. Chef's kiss. That's, a, that's impressive. That's efficient. That's what you want to see. Third down, an area where the Broncos were awful last year in the NFL. They were 8 of 15. That's 53% for them in terms of conversion rate on third down. They had a couple of third and nines that they converted. And look, Jared Stidham picked up a very impressive play late in the second quarter where Looks like the defense was about to sack him. He dipped up underneath and ran for 20 yards. Like, hey, hey, now you're in the red zone. So I, I thought Denver's operation was important. 494 yards of offense here. Sean Payton likes that. But let's take a look at the balance here. When you look at, okay, you have 80 plays. You average 6.2 plays per gain on, on a play. You ran for over 152 yards, which is a great formula. Anything over, I, I'd say, if you average 120 plus yards per game, you're in a good sitting and you have an opportunity to win a lot of games having that formula here. 342 total yards passing through the air between Jarrett Stidham and obviously Ben DiNucci combined there. Eight penalties, though, a little bit of a concern. Eight penalties that accounted for 80 yards. That's something that they're going to have to clear up a little bit. Holding, false start. These are things that are fixable. Uh, so for me, I'm not necessarily worried about that. It wasn't like there were too many plays you were like oh man that's just a lack of discipline now I will say they did call Drew Sanders Broncos rookie linebacker for a suplex which if you look at the replay not necessarily a penalty because he's got him wrapped up it, it'd be different if he suplexed him and like threw him and let him go that's different but I mean he's wrapping up a guy who's a little bit you know stocky and he's holding on to him and he's bringing him to the ground I didn't necessarily agree with that penalty on Drew Sanders they called Albert O for unnecessary roughness on a play it ended up offsetting because two of the Los Angeles Rams players also got unnecessary roughness as well. But 
Zero turnovers. That's the key, right? Denver did a really good job protecting the football. And you want to know how many times they punted on Saturday? Once. They punted one time. Riley Dixon had a 60-yard punt. He continues to be impressive. But now we get to the kicking game. Everybody's had concerns about that after the first preseason game. I think Den- I think fans had a lot of concerns about a lot of things after the first preseason game. But these guys have built along. They've gotten more game reps. They've gotten more action here. Brett Maher, very efficient on the evening. Two for two on field goal attempts, five for five on all of his extra points. It seems like right now, barring anything drastic, he will be the Broncos kicker this upcoming season. So that's always nice to see. And I think the the other important metric we got to talk about here, time of possession. Denver controlled the clock, 36 minutes and 14 seconds in comparison to the Rams only having the ball for 23 total minutes of the game. That's what you want to do. You want to have smothering defense. You want to have a very good run offense. And you want to have efficient quarterback play while protecting the football. In a perfect world, right? It makes sense. But it's hard to do these things in the course of an NFL game. Denver did a really good job as well. But let's talk about some other players as well defensively. I think Drew Sanders and Justin Sternod, both guys at the linebacker spot, I thought they looked pretty impressive there as that duo. Drew Sanders came away with an interception and had a return. And I'll tell you this, like, this is a guy who's picking things up very, very quickly. Sean Payton gave him a lot of praise in the postgame press conference here. But for a guy who, you know, coming in as, as a rookie, there's a little bit of an adjustment to the speed. And we, I think we saw that in the first game. Second game is like, all right, hey, he picked it up. He realized, hey, this is how fast it is. Here's how fast I've got to play. Third game looks so comfortable. When we talk about blitzing, creating pressure, playing against the run, clogging passing lanes. He is going to be a weapon for the Broncos defense. And I'm very curious and very excited to see maybe how Vance Joseph looks to utilize him. But overall, came away impressed. The same Bassey once again coming up with an interception. Three preseason games, three interceptions. He's a roster lock at cornerback. Jaquan McMillan playing really well as well. He's a roster lock, in my opinion, in the cornerback. It's going to be very curious to see what happens at the safety position in terms of how that plays out. Justin Simmons made his return to practice last week, which is a great sign. He should be good to go for week one. Caden Stearns obviously expected to be the starter. P.J. Locke had the injury. So how does this impact maybe Kareem Jackson standing? How did Delirian Turner yell, J.L. Skinner? How did these guys perform in the preseason in the eyes of the coaching staff that they feel like, okay, hey, we need to put them on the active roster or they go to the practice squad? Will they clear waivers? I mean, there's all these questions, but when teams are going from 90 to 53, you consider the waiver wire order, there's a lot of different moves that are going to have to make. Teams are going to have to make and try to prioritize to put a claim in on some of these guys versus them just clearing it and passing it. So to be very curious to see how things shake out, obviously, for the roster cuts. The deadline is on Tuesday at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. That's 2 o'clock p.m. for you mountain time folks there. But with that said, Broncos country, hope you enjoyed your cup of coffee, your morning conversation covering all things Denver Broncos. Roster cuts are happening. We'll break it down. We'll give you everything you need to know as they happen. We'll tell you why it's important, and you're going to get that here on GMB. Once again, just wanted to give a special shout-out to our friends over there at Superbook Sports for sponsoring this show. Broncos country, see you tomorrow morning.